So many of the people that end up embroiled in a white collar crime investigation never imagined in a million years they would become immersed in a government investigation. We have written for many years, uh, many of our clients, including uh, myself, could have imagined getting the rarest disease before ever be before ever getting indicted and going to federal prison. And that's really no different with white collar crime, specifically embezzlement. And what we're gonna, what I'm gonna cover today in this video. Embezzlement, along with some proactive steps on how to manage an embezzling charge, uh, because we've had a lot of these cases recently in our team. We are speaking and thinking of some really creative content to create. And we've had some clients, unfortunately, charged with embezzlement. So we figured this would be a time to discuss it and to share, of course, some mitigation strategies. So a couple of things to consider and what I find interesting regarding embezzlement and theft, there are some differences to it. To begin, in, embezzlement, unfortunately, comes with a fine of up to 50 grand. There can be state charges. But what's more important is a potential sanction of up to, to 20 years in federal prison. So uh, the big difference between embezzlement and theft, this has come up and I'll, I'm gonna read directly from an article a team member wrote. Embezzlement is different from other types of theft or fraud. The employee has company permission to handle the company's, the employee has permission to handle the company's property, but does not have permission to use it for personal use. Instead, the employee uses the position of trust granted by the company to take the property. In other theft or fraud cases, the employee never had uh, never had permission to handle the property at all. So coming back for a moment, to give you an example of a client of ours with whom we're working without getting all the specific details, uh, a client of ours is a bookkeeper in Iowa. And through our work, we talk about some of the pressures and rationalizations that compel someone to break the law. So in this case, it was a bookkeeper who'd worked for this organization for more than 15 years and unfortunately grew to kind of resent and load the job, the same nine to five grind every single day, nine to five grind every single day. Uh, didn't have a whole lot of excitement, felt bored, wasn't challenged, never promoted, didn't fully feel appreciated, was rarely told thank you or you're a real contributing member to this team. And over time, the resentments brew, they stew, they grow to the point where he was angry and besides hating his job, he began to hate many of the people with whom he worked. And I think it's interesting. A lot of studies have shown that it's not so much giving people more money that may make them happy. It could be as simple as a thank you. I appreciate you and how you contribute to our team. Well, this company didn't do that. It also didn't help that people got promoted and ahead of him and got paid more. So feeling these pressures, he rationalized that he was entitled to some perks of the profession, as he would argue it. And it started very subtly. He had access to a company credit card, access to some of the bank accounts and before getting into it, without getting into every single detail, you know how these stories go. Reimbursements on the American Express card, uh, having access to the bank account, slowly embezzling some money over a period of time. And in his mind, while he's driving home from work, he's probably telling himself, well, this is what I'm entitled to. I haven't gotten a raise. I don't get a thank you. It's the cost of living. And I'm going to enrich myself if they're not willing to do it. In time, through an audit, boom, they find out. He gets fired. An investigation begins. And just like that, he is indicted for embezzlement. In this case, it's more than a quarter million dollars. And according to the sentencing guidelines, he could be looking at as much as 30 months in federal prison. One step we will discuss in this five steps of embezzlement cases is potentially paying back the money because paying back the money in advance of a sentencing hearing is a very good mitigating factor, can show some good intentions to the judge. It always helps to pay back a victim. The victim in this case is his employer. And uh, it's just a very, def uh, very tough situation. So as I transition back into this, screen share a little bit, um, and I'm gonna put up a link to this article that I encourage you uh, to read. In this article, we write a little bit about an executive who worked for um, a union. He embezzled several hundred thousand dollars over an extended period of time by creating illegitimate financial records. And similar to the situation I just uh, described, this defendant's looking at a long time in federal prison after pleading guilty to wire fraud due to his embezzling. What I think is important if, if unfortunately you ever get into trouble is to do, invest the time and due diligence to retain the right team. And, and that includes hiring the right criminal defense attorney. Dealing with embezzlement, just the name is scary, right? It, it almost feels like kind of like right out of the movies a little bit, embezzlement. It sounds like a real crook, a real criminal. Well, you're not a criminal. 
uh, you made some bad decisions. And what you have to do is not make matters worse. You have to stop the bleeding. And something we talk a lot about at prison professors and all of our companies from white collar advice to prison professors to compliance mitigation, which creates compliance programs, is post-defense conduct, not making matters worse. How many people have gone to prison like Martha Stewart because of the post-defense conduct? That's a big part of the reason I went to prison, the post-defense conduct, the lying and covering up. So one of the first things you have to do if, God forbid, you become embroiled in a government investigation for embezzlement is stop the bleeding. And that means you have to work openly and honestly with people you hire, people you retain. If not, you're flushing money down the toilet. Too many defendants are afraid to speak openly and honestly because of how they're going to be judged. They want to be seen as a good person. They want others to focus on the good things they do in their life. I get it. If you're going to retain people, then you've got to speak openly and honestly. They need to know every detail. And I can assure you, if you're going to come clean about an embezzlement case, that will be the least uh, interesting thing a good lawyer has heard in a long time because a good lawyer has heard absolutely everything. So that's the first thing you really need to do is be prepared to speak openly and honestly. Denial, as my mom likes to say, is not just a river in Egypt. I think it's Egypt, could be Africa, I think it's Egypt. You get it. Be prepared to speak openly and honestly. If not, you're gonna flush money down the toilet, you're gonna get a longer prison term and you're gonna only have more regret. Another tip, even if you have some resources, consider retaining or having a federal public defender appointed to you. Uh, if you want to retain a lawyer, make sure you hire the right lawyer. I'll put up a link to a video our team filled called film called 12 Questions to Ask a Lawyer. The truth is you've probably never hired a lawyer before, certainly a criminal defense attorney. You don't know how to hold them accountable. You don't know what questions to ask. And uh, we do. And we want to help you whether you call us or not. We want to help you make better decisions. So I'll put a link to that 12 Questions to Ask a Lawyer video in this description. Now, coming back to proactive steps that you need to take, we just covered right here, as our colleague so beautifully wrote, remember to discuss all legal, all available legal defenses uh, with, with counsel. Now we're going to talk about five steps uh, that you'll have to take if you're charged with embezzlement, theft, or really any white-collar crime, but specifically embezzlement. And this is the advice we gave our client, the bookkeeper in Iowa, who unfortunately was indicted, but reached out to us right after he got into trouble by way of doing what many people do, searching the internet, going to YouTube, looking for guidance and advice, reached out and said, I'm in some trouble. I'm in Iowa. I need to hire a lawyer. Will you help? I did it. And he had identified step number one. He was very proactive. So he got informed by going to YouTube and watching videos, but he wasn't afraid to ask tough questions such as, that may work for somebody else. Why will that work for me? That worked for that person. How do I know that's going to help me? That guy you talked about is in a totally different situation for me. He's married with four kids. I'm younger, no children. What do I do? So the the great thing about YouTube is you get a lot of information. You can get informed, but also it's good to pick up the phone. You can pick up the phone and call our team and get very specific information for you. In this case, we he was proactive. We helped him hire a lawyer. He didn't want to go to the federal public defender. We helped him hire the lawyer, which means we helped him vet the lawyer. From there, our team uh, obtained attorney-client privilege with this law firm. So when we speak, we're able to speak openly with a great deal of privilege, with privilege. So everything we say, we can't be subpoenaed down the road. We will often do that with cases that uh, where the defendant has yet to, yet to plead guilty or even been convicted. So to point number one, this our client or anyone, he was very proactive in learning about all the stages in the criminal process, from the investigation to sentencing, to mitigation, to character reference letters, to the narrative. He watched the videos we filmed with the federal judges, Judge Boo and Judge Bennett. Those are gold, gold. You have federal judges telling you how to mitigate, how to be proactive, whether you do it or not is on, is on you. But to our client's credit, he was very proactive. The second step you have to follow you want to be, uh, you want to discuss with counsel all of the effective mitigation strategies. Steps you put in place or decisions you make today will heavily influence your life down the road. For example, I encouraged our client to look for work. So he was fired, of course, from his job for embezzlement or as the indictment alleges. And rather than sit around all day and do nothing, I said, you've got to look for work or document that you're looking for work. Why is that relevant? Well, it comes back to the step number one of being proactive. But also, if he can land a new job and begin to earn a, a living as a law-abiding citizen, it's a wonderful mitigation strategy because he's working. He's making money. They can pay back the victims, but it also gets him further away from his conduct. His case was delayed in part due to the pandemic. And he, like many people, have said, hey, was it a good thing my case was delayed? And I'm like, kind of like what my daughter says, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. How are you spending your days? What do you do all day? Are you productive? 
Are you sitting around saying it is what it is? Happy talk. It'll be fine. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't have bad intent. They didn't give me a raise. I felt a lot of pressure. They didn't appreciate me. Other people got promoted. I worked there for 20 years. All true. The wrong message. It's not step number one of being proactive. So you should absolutely begin discussing with your lawyers or a team what you can do to be proactive and ensure that if God forbid you get sentenced, you get the shorter sentence possible. That's working, saving some money. If there's any issues of substance abuse or drinking, you can begin to document them now. There's only one early release program that exists in the Federal Bureau of Prisons called the Residential Drug Abuse Program. And if you properly document any history of abuse at the right time, at the right message, that could qualify you for early release. Well, the, the, this is the time to begin doing that. So that's the third uh, step as well. But going on to, uh, going to the third step of talking with the, the lawyers or with us or anyone you feel comfortable, if they have the skill set and background and evidence that shows they can actually help. We're big proponents of due diligence, of doing homework, uh, of making sure that people actually do what they say they do. That's why speaking to clients, reviewing case studies, looking at reviews are important. Just because a talking head on YouTube says they can help you doesn't mean they can. So you want to talk with a, a team about what actually has to happen to get probation or the shorter sentence possible, or what could even what could be put in place now to get home confinement, or if you go to prison, out as early as possible, especially due to the CARES Act. For example, a client of ours, the government asked for 12 years. He was given 37 months. We prepared him properly for the probation report. This comes back to, to step three of retaining a mitigation team, of fully understanding how the probation report will influence not just your sentence, but time inside. By virtue of disclosing health issues in the probation report, his case manager is compelled or suggested he will be released after serving just 25% of a sentence. Think about that for a moment. Because he was proactive and he made the right steps as articulated in one and two, he, the government asked for 12 years, he got 37 months, he'll be home in 10 months. It didn't happen by accident. So it, I encourage you to be proactive and working, holding everyone you hire accountable, but being proactive to understand how a decision you make today could influence your life in six months or a year, five or 10 years. It may be hard because it's hard dealing with an indictment. It may be, it's, 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 a, it's a life shaking experience. I mean, let's not spin that it's a really difficult experience. It's hard. It's supposed to be hard and there are massive consequences that follow. But this is what I've learned. The end arrives. The end is coming. You're going to reach the end. Did I just say that three times? I think I did. But it's coming. The question is, how prepared will you be on the other end once this is over? So if you can put in proper steps today and begin to think about life on the other side today, when it comes, you're going to be more prepared. If not, it's going to be, as Michael likes to say, a parade of horribles. The, the struggle, the trauma, the pain, the inconveniences are only going to continue. It never really ends. So our team wants you to be ready for that now, and that should start with adding the right people to the team. Uh, continuing, step number four, our, our, our client, uh, so thoroughly wrote, working with sentencing experts on a post-sentencing strategy. So well, what exactly does, does that mean? I'm going to break off of this screen share for a moment, okay? Working with sentencing on a post-sentencing strategy. Well, people, of course, are obsessed with the shortest prison term. That's like, of course, I was in your shoes. You want the shortest prison term. So sometimes it can be hard to focus on post-sentencing. Why? You're so obsessed with getting the shortest prison term, but you've got to learn, you've got to marry these things together and understand the decisions you make now, the correct decisions at the right time, will help you not just at sentencing, they'll continue to help you long past sentencing. So let's go through a couple of examples. Community service, for example, some clients of ours will create extent, will create community service courses, lesson plans with our team. And that lesson plan may be disseminated into prisons and jails across the country. Any of you know my business partner, Michael Santos, who served 26 consecutive years in prison. I met him there. While there, he got an undergraduate and master's degree, wrote score many, many books on the, on the criminal justice system, published author. Upon his release, began working as a professor at San Francisco State. Stick with me. Bear with me. I'll tell you in a moment why this is relevant. Upon his release from prison, he was invited to create content for prisons and jails across the country. Well, some clients of ours who have the right skill set and who are authentic and who can teach may participate in some of that programming. And Michael can then disseminate that educational material to people in jails and prisons. Well, imagine going to sentencing with tens of thousands of people having gone through your work through this course, kind of a big deal. Back to point number four and why it helps post-sentencing. You can go to a sentencing hearing and say, X amount of people are going through my work. 
could also teach this course in jail, better than scrubbing toilets and showers. Then someday you can share that work with a case manager in prison. Let them know what you've learned from this experience, why you want to give back. Then on probation, you can share this work with a case manager, potentially lead to higher levels of liberty, being able to transfer on probation, get off probation early. So even now, as crazy as it may sound, you wanna be giving thought to post-sentencing strategies because eventually, as I said, this experience is going to end. And I want, I want to get you there as quickly as possible. And this comes, and I'll close with, uh, with point number five, which is something I've kind of been discussing throughout this whole process. Even now, you begin to prepare for life after prison. So if you're married, you have children, or you have a family supporting you, you should recognize this process will be harder on them. Yes, you may be the one serving time in prison, standing for count, using the toilets, the showers, the prison job you may not like, you'll adjust, we're humans, we've overcome worse. It's gonna be harder on those that love and support you. So to the extent that you can begin to put measures in place now, you're gonna make it easier for your family now, but also on the other side, because they're watching. They're watching your actions and your movements, and they're wondering how you're responding to this adversity that you created. I know many of you watching this have overcome great adversity in life and have uh, endured hardship, the difference may be in those other adversarial cases, you didn't create them. They happened, right? It's like a client, a good friend of mine, unfortunately had cancer and he didn't choose to have cancer. Of course you have empathy for him. Well, sometimes as convicted felons, some people may not have empathy for you because you chose it. So you've got to embrace this underdog mantra, I think, that people may not have sympathy for you, say that you chose to, to do this, there are consequences that follow. You can expect some fallout of your network. You can expect to be ostracized and shunned from your network. It's part of the process. You can complain and bitch, and as some people do, or you can say, I'm, I'm going to own it. And I'm going to begin to come back to step number one, be proactive and prepare and hire the right legal team and begin to mitigate now. So embezzlement, like any white collar crime, is um, what's the right way to say it? It's just not easy to become part of a government investigation and to deal with the massive fallout. So if you're waiting to plead guilty, waiting to, to go to trial, waiting for sentencing or waiting to go to, to prison, uh, we need you to be productive and begin thinking about not just sentence or life in prison, but what life is like on the other side. Thank you so much for watching this video. I encourage all of you to subscribe to the Prison Professor's YouTube channel. Again, in the YouTube description, I'm gonna put up a link to I have saliva on my mouth, okay. <laughs> when you talk so much, it happens. On the YouTube channel, uh, in the description, I'm gonna put up a link to this uh, great article that our colleague wrote of five steps of embezzlement cases. I'm gonna put up a link to the 12 questions to ask a lawyer, because back to pro, uh, number one, step number one, you wanna be proactive. I'm gonna put a link to the video that Michael Santos did with Judge Boo. I'm gonna put a link to the YouTube video Michael Santos did with Judge Bennett. And last but not least, uh, I'm gonna put up a five minute clip from a video I filmed with Dr. Phil. And in this five minute clip, it articulates the four points you want to convey in a sentencing narrative or in a sentencing statement, presuming you've pled guilty and you're remorseful and your goal is to get the shortest sentence. Thank you so much for watching. Go ahead and subscribe and we're gonna be back with more great content soon. I am Justin Bapernian. I'm so proud and fortunate to be able to teach and guide you as is our team. Goodbye.